Good morning. How's everybody doing? Woo! Woo! All right. Some of, some of you non-woo people, you're probably like, this better be good because my seat is not where it normally is. I'm very upset. Um, no, but welcome to Ocean City Church. Like Dave said, my name's Mike. I'm one of the elders here. Um, and we've been going through our Ain't No Grave series, kind of doing a different approach. Like he said, I forgot today was Palm Sunday because um, we've been doing it a little bit different. Um, we talked about uh, the Thursday before the resurrection a couple of weeks ago. Uh, last week we talked about Friday, Good Friday, and today we're talking about Saturday. Uh, it's called Holy Saturday. I know I learned that this week. I didn't know. I just thought it was just like Saturday. I don't know. Um, and uh, it's definitely the lame day. Um, all the other days have like cool stuff going on, like Palm Sunday. You know, the kids with the palms and like do the stuff. That's cool. Um, Monday, Thursday. I thought it was always Monday, Thursday. Um, and that's not what it is. Monday is like, it means mandate. We, I learned that when Derek preached. That was cool. Um, cool stuff going on on that day, Last Supper. Um, on Friday, Good Friday, Jesus is crucified. Ugh, I mean, geez. Um, and then the Resurrection Sunday, amazing. Um, Saturday is the in-between day, the day we are just waiting on the resurrection. So thanks, Dave and Derek, <laughs> for Saturday. Um, so, I mean, today we're going to talk a little bit about waiting, um, and this is not something that we are good at, um, and I was just thinking about just kind of daily life and when we encounter waiting, um, let me paint a couple scenarios for you. Imagine yourself, you're in the grocery store, you know, you're finding all of your carefully selected items, cart's full, and you're like, all right, it's time to check out, right? So, you know, you walk up to the checkout line, and you just get in any old line, right? No, you scan, right? You're like, okay, I got two people over here. I got three people over here. There's only one person here, but their cart is huge. I'm not going in that line, right? I've got to save this four minutes of my life and make sure that I choose the correct line so that I don't have to wait very long, right? Or imagine this. Imagine um, you're driving on our beautiful A1A, you know, like Saturday afternoon, like tons of traffic, blech. Um, and you pull up to a red light, and in the lane you're in, you got 10 cars stopped. And you're like, man. And then you look over to the next lane, and there's only two cars stopped. So what do we all do? Well, we say, you know, this lane's been treating me really good. I'm just going to kind of stay. You know, no need to change lanes. No, we change lanes. We've got to save 22 seconds from when the light turns green to make sure that we get across that line much faster. Right? I've even seen, I've like changed lanes just for one extra car. That's it. It's silly when you think about it, but I don't like to wait. We don't like to wait. Um, and one thing I learned about this week uh, that uh, Weight Watchers is getting in on this, W-E-I-G-H-T. That would be a cool, like, wait. Uh, no. So, uh, so they uh, realize in their research and stuff that the, s the slower you eat, the less likely you are to overeat. And so they've got this thing that they call, they call mindful eating. It's kind of like a cool thing. And they have all kinds of cool ideas like, okay, while you're eating, you know, after each bite, like put your fork down, right? And then pick up your fork and take a bite, right? You'll eat less. They say try to like take a sip of water maybe and you'll, eat, you'll slow yourself down. You'll eat less. And then the other suggestion they've got is maybe pace yourself with the slowest eater, right? Do you like eat super fast and then you're just like waiting for like the other person? Um, if you kind of slow yourself down, you'll eat less. Um, but I'll tell you one place that does not work um, with kids. They are the friggin' worst at eating. They are so slow all the time. The berries have a gaggle of kids, and the worst is our four-year-old Ari. Oh, my gosh. Like, we sit down to eat. Everyone's eating, and she goes, eh, um, can I be done? And you look at her plate, and you're like, you didn't eat anything. No, you can't. Be this is dinner time. Like, what have you been doing the whole time? I don't understand. We teach her. She's four years old, so we say, you have to eat four bites of everything. And then you're done to try to give her something to hang on to. But she takes forever. And I would love for you to think that the berries, like, just love family dinner time. It's no big deal if that just gets stretched out. You know, we're just learning about each other's day praying, you know, singing <laughs> worship songs and stuff. It's like, no, what happens most days is Ari's at the table by herself, and we are doing dishes, we're doing homework, we're doing baths, and she is just kind of content, like just, okay, I'm just going to chill here and eat my four bites. So, man, 
we are, we are horrible. She's unfazed. I don't get it. But we don't like to wait, right? It's uncomfortable. It's not fun. Um, what's really scary, I don't know if you've noticed this about yourself. Maybe it's just me. But if I'm like waiting in line, I have like an instinct, like my, my phone's always in my back pocket. And I'm just like, boom, right here. Like, even if it's like, like nothing is happening. And I'm just like, that's just like instinct. And that, I think it's a problem. I'm pretty sure. Um, you know, God forbid I like talk to a stranger. Jeez. Um, you know, or maybe just like observe the world around me. <laughs> Instead, I'm just like, I can't wait for two minutes and not stare at this thing. It's a problem. It's a big problem. And so today we are talking about Holy Saturday. And you know what? I am going to rename it. Holy, it's a terrible name. Like they just picked a random Bible word. I'm going to rename it and we're going to call it Waiting Saturday. That's what we're going to do. It's going to be Waiting Saturday. Um, and today we're going to dig into the word and we're going to answer three main questions today. One, what did the Pharisees do on Holy Waiting Saturday? Next, what did the disciples do on Holy Waiting Saturday? And then lastly, what did Jesus do on Holy Waiting Saturday? So that's what we're going to dig into today. Um, so first, what did the Pharisees do? Um, I know a lot of us will probably approach waiting differently based on personality and also probably based on circumstance. But a lot of us, I'm going to guess in here, um, when you're presented with waiting, you're the type of person that has got to do something. I can't just sit and wait. I've got to act. Give me something to do. It doesn't matter if it doesn't mean anything. I just need to do something. I'm just like, I do something with my hands. What do I do? What do I do? You know, if you are you the type of person that, you know, if you get a, a, a medical test or something like that? Are you going home even before the results are there and you're researching possible results? Based on those results, you're also researching common, you know, uh, you know practices for uh, procedures and stuff. You're like, you can't wait. You've got to act. You've got to do something. Or what about, you know, if you're, uh, if someone's upset with you? Oh, that's the worst feeling when someone's upset with you. Are you the type that, you know, just says, you know, I'll just let them, you know, I'll give them some space, you know, or are you the type that's like, uh, you know, I've got to make things right. You know, it's good to make things right. I'm going to get all up in their business and, and like be all over them and try to control this and say, we got to fix this because I feel horrible and I don't like feeling like that. I'm going to act, right? We want to be in control of everything. And so if that's you, great job. Your company is the Pharisees. Yikes. So <laughs> let's see, let's see what these Pharisees did on Holy Waiting Saturday. We're going to jump into Matthew 27, starting in verse 62. So it says, the next day, that is after the day of preparation, that's after Good Friday, the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered before Pilate and said, Sir, we remember how that imposter, Jesus, said while he was still alive, after three days I will rise, therefore... Order the tomb to be made secure until the third day, lest his disciples go and steal him away and tell the people he has risen from the dead. And the last fraud will be worse than the first. Pilate said to them, you have a guard of soldiers, go, make it as secure as you can. So they went and made the tomb secure by sealing the stone and setting a guard. Now, remember, the Pharisees... You know, they were the, the Jewish leaders, religious, social, political leaders in Jerusalem. They were very important. Um, and if you've read the Gospels, Jesus was not a fan of them. And he made sure that they knew that. Uh, we always think of, you know, Jesus just loves everyone, not Pharisees. He talks to them not so lovingly. Um, he really calls them out on a lot of their, a lot of their stuff. And... Uh, and lo and behold, you know, the Pharisees, they were the ones that conspired to kill Jesus. They wanted to, you know, shut this thing down. This was a threat to their kingdom, you know, that they had built for themselves under the law and under traditions that made them prominent and influential in society. They had control. Jesus was a threat to that control, and they needed to act. They were try and, and they were doing pretty good, right, at shutting down the Jesus movement. They killed Jesus. Like, they're 
they're doing good, I guess, you know. Um, and what's, what's cool, or cool about this is, so they remembered that Jesus said he was going to rise from the dead. We'll learn in a little bit in, in question number two, the disciples even kind of forgot that. Right, which is wild to think about that difference. But they were like, okay, he said this, and we got to act. This is not a wait and see thing to see what happens. Like, we'll be okay, probably. No, they acted. They went to Pilate, um, and they asked for a guard um, to guard this, to make sure that they preserve their control, their power, their authority. They didn't want to take any chances. So, Pilate grants them a guard of soldiers, um, which in some of the commentaries I read was was fascinating. So a guard of Roman soldiers was usually four or more um, because whatever they were guarding, whatever it was, two people would be on guard and the other two would be sleeping and they'd be switching. Um, and And these are Roman soldiers trained to do this. So the thought that, oh, like the, the Romans, they just like fell asleep. It's like, Nope, not, not really. That was the whole point of the guard of soldiers. Um, they were fully armored, ready for battle. Um, and what was interesting to read also, so, you know, the, tool, the tomb, you know, the stone was rolled in front of the tomb and in one sense sealed the tomb. That was nothing new. That was very common. It's not like they put the, the rock there because it was super heavy and they didn't want anyone to get in. What the sealing that the Pharisees did and these Roman soldiers did was something very specific in Roman times. So what they did is they had this kind of rope thing that they would put across whatever they were sealing. And at each end, they would kind of put this like heavy wax to hold it in place at the ceiling point. So they would have laid this rope across the stone and sealed it on both sides. And so if that seal was broken like that, then the Roman seal was broken. The soldiers... When they got to the scene, they, they witnessed the sealing happening and then were charged. It is your job to make sure that this seal is not broken under the authority of Rome, right? So this is a big deal, right? So big, in fact, that if that seal is broken, it's very likely that they would get executed for not doing their job, right? So this is a big deal. The Pharisees, they are taking no chances. They have hired mercenaries, essentially, to guard this thing. Um, and in some ways it really like, you know, it, it's a little bit of a tell of just like what they were dealing with, this level of insecurity of like, we've got to hold on to this. We've got to do everything we can. And we're kind of looking at them now thinking like, well, geez, like what, what do you think you were going to stop? You know, I was thinking about, you know, if I'm preaching up here and just imagine, you know, maybe for some reason, some precaution, I wanted to bring in like an army ranger, right? And he was like standing over here, full fatigues, full gear, had like, you know, his you know, finger on the trigger, just kind of like standing here. You know, you would be looking at me seeing like, Mike, this is the beach. Like, we're chill. Like, what are you worried about? Like, what is going on in your head that you thought like this was necessary, right? It's kind of like that same thing. Um, there was such a threat to what they had built. They had to act. The fr- you know, they could have hired just some burly dudes to watch the tomb, but they went all out. They could not wait to see what happened. They had to act. What's interesting is later in the book of Acts, we see the Pharisees are, are learning a little bit, maybe about how to wait. Maybe the resurrection of Jesus like, helped them kind of realize maybe that, maybe that wasn't a good idea. But I do want to read this because I feel like it's such a good kind of um, contrast to maybe how they dealt with this. So in Acts 5, remember, I mean, so just quick context, the church is blowing up. Jesus has ascended. The Holy Spirit has come down. The apostles are preaching everywhere. The church is exploding. And they are trying to contain this, and it is very hard. They get in this rhythm of the apostles would be preaching. They would bring them in. They would say, don't preach the gospel. And they would say, no. And they would say, okay, we're going to beat you. And then they would send them back out. And they did that a few times. And this is one of those times the apostles came in. And while they brought them in, instead of like them having a conversation, they just started preaching the gospel to them. And we pick it up in Acts 5. Uh, and it says, when they had heard this, they were furious and wanted to put them to death. But a Pharisee named Gamaliel a teacher of the law who was honored by all the people, stood up in the Sanhedrin and ordered that the men be put outside for a while. Kind of like, we guys, we need to talk. Like, before we just 
kill some people. Let's, let's talk about this. Then he addressed the Sanhedrin. Men of Israel, consider carefully what you intend to do to these men. Some time ago, Thetis appeared, claiming to be somebody, and about 400 men rallied to him. He was killed, all his followers were dispersed, and it all came to nothing. After him, Judas the Galilean appeared in the days of the census and led a band of people in revolt. He too was killed, and all his followers were scattered. Therefore, in the present case, I advise you, leave these men alone, let them go. For if their purpose or activity is of human origin, it will fail. But if it is from God, you will not be able to stop these men. You will only find yourselves fighting against God. And I think that is something, you know, if this is, this is how you approach waiting, I think that's something to remember today. If that, like, need to act and the need to control is something that's coming from you, I, I think you gotta, like, you got to watch out. You might find yourself fighting against what God intended to do in your heart or in your life through that weight. So it's just something, just be, be aware of, the, the, my fellow type A'ers that want to do something. Um, you know, and, and I feel like we, we want to do something because we're like, something has to be done, right? How could, how could God put us in this situation? We've got to do something about this. Um, but just like uh, Gamaliel was saying, you know, who are we to question God, the creator of everything, right? He is God. We are not. He's not beholden to us and our preferences of how fast or slow the weight should go. Like, he has infinite wisdom compared to us. He's always working for our good and for our glory. Um, now, some of us maybe are not quite that like prone to take control and take action. I think some of us in the midst of the wait, um, you know, and some, sometimes can just be like, like frozen, right? We spend our time instead of taking action, like just in our head, worrying and fearing about the possibility and what is going on during this wait. It consumes us. And I think that brings us to our next question. What did the disciples do on Holy Waiting Saturday? And I think, I think they're in this boat. But before we get there, I mean, let's just remind ourselves just, like, what they are dealing with right now on Holy Saturday. You know, so they had given up everything to follow this Jesus. They were convinced that he was the Messiah going to save everything. And just two nights ago, you know, they were having dinner with him in the upper room, the Last Supper, with their friend, with their Savior. And then in the 36 hours following they saw, you know, Jesus emotionally wrecked in the Garden of Gethsemane, sweating drops of blood. They saw him arrested. They saw him beaten. They saw him tortured. They saw him traded for the murderer Barabbas by the very people that had welcomed him in just a week before. They saw him carry his own cross to Calvary. Peter had denied him three times. They saw Jesus get nailed to the cross. They saw him mocked. They saw him speared in the side. They saw the earth go dark, and they saw Jesus die on the cross. And then they rushed into the tomb. He got an incomplete burial, and now we're on Saturday. So, I mean, just can you imagine what they are feeling right now? I mean, it's just overwhelming. I think at the very least, shock just on the trauma that they just experienced you know, and, and just like heartbroken and mourning. Like this was their friend, like their savior. They just spent the past three years with this person following him everywhere and he's gone. So you can imagine the mourning. I also think there was an element of feeling lost. You know, in, in John chapter six, you know, Jesus is teaching some hard stuff and some people are leaving and he turns to the disciples and he says, are you gonna leave too? And Peter says this, he says, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life, and we have believed and have come to know that you are the only that you are the Holy One of God. I mean, they have built their lives around Jesus. Where else were they going to go? And now, with Jesus gone, they're sitting on Holy Saturday thinking, where are we going to go? And speaking of Peter, I mean, just think, think about him, right? So he just denied that he even knew Jesus three times. I'm just, I can just picture him just in the corner. 
gosh, just like weeping, just replaying that over and over and over again and realizing that all he wants to do is just like say he's sorry to Jesus and now he's gone and he can't. Think about James and John, the sons of thunder, thinking that is there something more we could have done? Should we have fought for him? Surely we would have died in his place to defend him. And we also see that they were very fearful as well. In John chapter 20, it says that the doors were locked because they were worried uh, and in fear of the Jews coming for them. I mean, the Pharisees just took down the Messiah and they're his crew, right? So if they're trying to tamp this out, they're making probably the right assumption that they, that they are next, right? And they're in absolute fear. They've locked themselves in a room. There's no, like, you know, super Christian here. They are terrified. So that's what the disciples were doing on Holy Saturday. They were just waiting in mourning and fear. It's hard to come down too hard on them, but I think it op- like some of this kind of opens up some insight onto how just like, you know, we deal with waiting. You know, sometimes we are in situations where we are powerless, and the only thing there is to do is just to wait. That's a really hard place to be. And I think in our human nature, like in our minds and in our hearts, like there's always, there's a wait, there's a wait and something else. You know, for the Pharisees, it was wait and do something. I got to act. I think for the disciples, it was, it was wait and fear. It was wait and worry. What's wild is all four of the gospels all around this time while the disciples were waiting, they really hammer home the fact that they were just not expecting Jesus to rise from the dead. Even though there are, like, amongst the four Gospels, something like 21 times Jesus told them, hey, I'm going to die, but then I'm going to raise again in three days. And even, you know, on Resurrection Sunday, when they start to hear news that Jesus had raised from the dead, they didn't even believe it. They didn't remember Jesus saying things like John 16, 20, you will, you will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will turn into joy. Or 16, 22, you have sorrow now, but I will see you again and your hearts will rejoice and no one will take your joy from you. John 16, 33, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I've overcome the world. They forgot that in Matthew 17, he said, When they came together in Galilee, he said to them, The Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men. They will kill him, and on the third day he will be raised to life. So what Jesus, what God was trying to do with the disciples is, yes, he knew that they were going to wait and. But his intent was that they would wait and hope. He gave them, like, this is what's going to happen. Like, it's it's not going to be great. And you're going to wait. But you can wait and hope. Jesus wanted them to know and expect that the story was not over yet. He wanted them to believe that he was who he said he was. And sometimes I think there's just nothing to do but wait and hope. You know, I think about, you know, we see war going on on the other side of the world. And you feel just helpless. Is there anything I can even do? Sometimes a relationship, you know, is disintegrating. You've done all you can do. All you can do now is just wait and hope. Sometimes you want Jesus to come back and just to end all of this suffering and all of this pain that you see in your life or around the world. And all we can do is wait and hope. But just like Jesus did to the disciples, God tells us what this hope is like. He says things like, in Isaiah 54.10, Though the mountains be shaken and the hills be removed, yet my unfailing love for you will not be shaken, nor my covenant of peace be removed, says the Lord, who has compassion on you. Or Romans 8.38-39, For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation, will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. There are so many promises in this book. 
and God keeps his promises. So read it, know it, meditate on it, write it on your soul so that when you're in that spot of waiting, you can wait and hope instead of wait and despair or wait and fear. In Hebrews 10, 23, it says, Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. So wait, wait and hope. It's simple. It's true. But dang, is it hard. Because I think it's very common for us to be in that spot of waiting on God to come through. And it can be so frustrating because he apparently is doing nothing. Right? You feel abandoned. You feel like he doesn't care. And so you're just like, well, I, if he's not going to worry about it, then I got to worry about it. Right? If he's not going to act, then I got to act. If he is not going to do something, then I've got to do something. Because it feels like he's doing nothing. How could he let this go on and keep doing nothing? Has God forgotten about me? Is he even paying attention? And that pushes us to our last question today. What did, what did Jesus do on Holy Saturday? And just like what we just talked about, that frustration, it sure seems like Jesus was doing a whole lot of nothing on Saturday, right? The disciples are in anguish, and is he just like chilling in the tomb, just like kind of like watching the ball drop, like on the resurrection? <laughs> He's nowhere to be found, and they need him right now. And this type of sentiment, this frustration with God is not something new at all, right? You see it in the Old Testament everywhere. In the Psalms, David is frustrated that God is remaining silent amongst his enemies. You know, enemies that are mocking him and mocking God. And David's like, do you hear? Do you, like, what are you doing? You're doing nothing. You also see it in Habakkuk, which is a book in the Bible, if you're not familiar. It's not common one. Um, but look, look here. So this is Habakkuk's a, a minor prophet, and he's telling God, he's saying, oh Lord, how long shall I cry for help and you will not hear? Or cry to you violence and you will not save? Why do you make me see iniquity and why do you idly look at wrong? Destruction and violence are before me. Strife and contention arise. So the law is paralyzed and justice never goes forth. For the wicked surround the righteous so justice goes forth perverted. And then God, God responds, which is so cool. He responds and he tells Habakkuk this. He says, look among the nations and see, wonder and be astounded. For I am doing a work in your days that you would not believe if told. So we're going to get into this, but do you realize that God is, is God? Right? We have a limited perspective on what we can see. And he sees everything. Who are we to say that what we are seeing in our present circumstances is all that there is? Like you've got, we've got to remember our limitations here. Rem I mean, remember, you know, just there's a whole like spiritual dimension, which I forget about all the time. You know, but it is a mention where like God and the angels are like waging war against the powers of darkness. And there's multiple instances in the Bible where like, you know, I think it was either Elijah or Elisha, you know, their eyes were opened and they saw what was actually happening. And they were just like, oh my gosh, there are armies on my side. He created the universe. He's outside of time. He holds the Pleiades stars in his hand, like it says in Job. He is God. And we are not. We are, therefore, underqualified to accuse God of anything. In this passage in Habakkuk, God is reminding us of this, that he is always at work even when we don't see it. I love this John Piper quote I came across. He said, God is always doing 10,000 things in your life, and you may be aware of three of them. Right? I mean, just like, just think about just the good news of that, you know? You may be aware of three of them, and maybe it seems like zero. But you see in Habakkuk, you see, like, God, God, 
He's doing way more than we could ever know. So what was God doing that the disciples were not aware of? Who remembers their Apostles' Creed? Anybody? Maybe? I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. Did you hear it? Descended into hell? What? (sighs) What in the world does that mean? So, I asked myself the same question this week. um, Because it seems like God is doing nothing, but if this, like, well, what is this? Because this seems like way different than nothing. And what's wild is, like, so, just to kind of get a a peek of what my week was like, um, there's a lot of crazy theories out there about this, where, you know, some people have gone down some kind of weird rabbit holes of, like, what this means and what Jesus was doing down there and who was there and who he talked to or whatever, um, and I want to share just a little bit of the process, at least that I went through, to tr- start to make sense of this. Like, what does this mean? How is this applicable for us? Like, what are the implications here? Um, and uh, and first off, just like like where do we start? Um, and where where you start is just biblical context. Okay, so I've got this. He descended into hell idea. I'm gonna read. You know. Uh, all of the four Gospels about the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus and see if there's something in there that kind of helps me kind of get my bearings of what this might mean and what Jesus did. Um, Unfortunately, there's not a whole lot there, um, which is hard. And so my next step is um, I'm going through kind of some trusted resources um, that maybe a lot of you have used too. It's not just random Google where you find random Google site that said, you know, Jesus was partying with the devil or something like that. No. Um, no. Uh, the big ones I go to, if you're curious, Desiring God, Gospel Coalition, Wayne Grudem's Systematic Theology, um, some commentaries on a couple of like Bible websites. Those things help me like get my bearings and help understand of like which passages people are pulling from to come to this conclusion. Um, and what's tricky about this is, uh, there are some differing opinions, and I don't know if you know this, there's lots of differing opinions on all kinds of things in the Bible. Um, it's not something we should be, like, afraid of or scared of, um, but, you know, as I'm preparing to preach, I was like, well, I've got to tell these people something, right? We're sitting in, like, this, like, hopeless situation, and, like, is there some hope here with Jesus descending into hell? What's wild is there are some people that think he didn't descend into hell at all, on Saturday at least. Um, And the people on that list are not slouches. These people are John Piper, St. Augustine, John Calvin, and Wayne Grudem. So it's like, okay. Uh, But then there are those that say he absolutely did descend into hell. The Martin Luther and every person that's recited the Apostles' Creed for the last 1,700 years. Okay? So, uh, so it's hard, you know, so if, so if these guys are on the same page, you know, is this a big problem? Um, and th- the next question I ask myself when it's like, okay, I'm wrestling with this, um, is uh, how important is this doctrine? How important is this? Because what's, what's wild is, like, there are all kinds of, like, crazy stuff that we come across in the Bible, if you are not coming across crazy stuff, then you're not reading hard enough, because it is there. There's stuff where you like read, and you're like, I don't know what I think of this. And it's, it's you know, we believe it's, it, this is the inerrant, holy word of God, and so it's probably important to kind of like figure out what we think of it. Um, but, but if you ever find yourself in that spot, know that you are in good company, right? These are like the you know, Hall of Fame theologians, you know, that are also wrestling with, like, some parts of Scripture. It's like, you're in good company. We don't have it all figured out. Um, But we do have the important things figured out. We're not just throwing out everything, right? And so one of the things, if you've been to um, our Theological Foundations course, we talk about theological triage, 
where basically we say, okay, there's a doctrine or something in the Bible, and we're trying to figure out how important is this thing in the grand scheme of the doctrine of Christianity. So I think I've got a cool little picture, graph, to help you get a visual. Um, But things like level one, the Trinity, uh, the deity of Jesus, justification by faith alone, these are things that separate Christianity from not Christianity. These are pretty important. If you are calling into question these types of things, you are skewing hard from the last kind of 2,000 years of Christianity. Level two, these are the types of things that maybe separate denominations. They do not separate, hear me when I say this, they do not separate Christians from non-Christians. Feels like that sometimes, doesn't it, though, in like church world? Um, but these are things that um, people realize, well, I think this, I think this. Okay, it's probably easiest if we, we kind of like, from ministry practicalities that we kind of like split up and do this. There's scattered church history there. And then there's level three. These are things that, you know, people can respectfully disagree on and live life together and love each other and be brothers and sisters in Christ. Um, So some things like that are your particular view on eschatology or the end times. There's all kinds of different theories. Um, Gospel freedom. Uh, This is not a complete list of all of the things, but, you know, should Christians be able to drink alcohol or not drink alcohol, right? We can still be, you know, good friends, and differ on conclusions that we come to that. The problem that the church comes to is when they take uh, level two and sometimes even level three things and elevate them so high to where they say, if you don't believe this, like, I can't even talk to you. And that is not the intent of this idea of the theological triage. So as we look at this, you know, it's important to, like, like there, there is some, some good stuff in this idea of Jesus descending into hell, which we're about to get into, and I'm so excited. But, um, but you have to know, as we're wrestling through things, like how important is this? Is this threatening, like level one thinking? Is I'm like thinking through this theory? Or is this not threatening that, and I'm maybe more in level three? I think we're in level three here. As I was kind of digging in, I think there's enough passages that I found, and when I read them through my simple, non-trained Hebrew, Greek mind, um, I feel like it's, it's clear enough to where I can, I can run with it. And it's not controversial, it's just, uh, and it just is what it is. I think Jesus descended into hell. Um, and so we don't throw up our hands. Um, we don't say, well, so... I was tempted this week just to skip it and be like, well, let's just not talk about it. That's easy. Um, but I think I've got an obligation to you guys to not do that and, like, get into the weeds and wrestle with it with you guys. Um, so there are a few things that these, everyone agrees on. And, and anytime you're, like, wrestling with these things, you have to make sure that you're not threatening solid doctrine as you're thinking, well, maybe it's this, maybe it's this. Jesus was not punished more in hell. All of the punishment happened on the cross. God's full wrath was poured out. And when Jesus said, it is finished, it is finished. He did not go to hell to like be chained up and tortured by the devil. Um, Jesus did not preach like a second chance gospel to those people in hell. Like they had another chance. The Bible is very clear that this life is, this is when people are saved and not saved in this life. And then lastly, where some people go with this is, they would, might say that Jesus went into hell and destroyed hell. And everyone that was there, he brought them all up to heaven. That is also threatening a lot of sound biblical doctrine that is not true. Um, so all the people that are maybe disagreeing on some of these things don't disagree on those items, despite what the conclusions they come to. So it's, um, sometimes it's fun to like dig into this and like learn this stuff. But what you can't miss when you're going into the weeds is you got to make sure that you come out and say, like, okay, well, what are the implications of this? Because I feel like, you know, I could spend tons of time reading these things and getting deep, but if, like, there's not, like, transformation happening in my heart because of it, maybe my time might be spent better somewhere else, like meditating on the love of Jesus or something, right? But... uh, What's amazing about this, this idea that, that Jesus descended into hell is remember, remember where we were, right? We're frustrated that God is doing nothing. And yet God says, you don't even know 
I'm doing so much more than you ever realized. The disciples are thinking, we are lost. Jesus is doing nothing. But in fact, Jesus was going into the very depths of hell for them at that exact moment that they were thinking about that. God was doing 10,000 things, and the disciples were maybe aware of three of them, right? So what does he want us to be aware of in this? He's doing 10,000, but what's awesome about the Bible and God is he's clear on some things that he wants us to know. And I think there's two huge things here. On Holy Saturday, Waiting Saturday, thing number one is that he is the king. When Jesus descends, this is not the first time that he's met Satan, right? Jesus, God created Satan. Right? And then if you remember in the desert where Jesus was tempted, and that, oh my gosh, I thought about this this week, the arrogance. Satan asked Jesus to bow down and worship him. He asked God, the God of the universe, to worship him. And it's wild. And so Jesus is showing up, and in my mind, like, I, I've probably got way too many, like, Hollywood movies in my head. But, like, in my mind, I feel like this is, like, Jesus is descending into hell not like for more punishment, but like as a victory lap. Like he's coming in, I picture him just like kicking the gates down and be like, hey Satan, remember me? Like, I don't know. I'm not a very intimidating person, but like, you know, whatever he like looks like. But, you know, and, and, and we read in Revelation, you know, uh, 1, 17, 6, or 1, chapter 1, verse 17 and 18, he said, when John, he says, when I saw him, I fell at his feet, although dead, but he laid his right hand on me saying, fear not, this is Jesus talking. I am the first and the last and the living one. I died and behold, I'm alive forever and I have the keys of death and Hades, right? Jesus descends into hell and says, hey, Satan, remember me? And oh, by the way, I'm gonna need those keys because guess who's king of this now? I am the king. I'm the king of heaven part of creation. I came to earth and I, I'm king of the earth and I've come all the way down to the gates of hell. And oh, by the way, I'm king of that too. And I'm taking these keys with me. You are powerless now. How amazing. He claimed his rightful kingship. God is not worried about hell like it's off limits, like, oh, I can't be anywhere near Satan. God, he, he is the king of it all. Nothing happens outside of his will. He is the king, and he's got the keys to prove it. So as we wait on, on this side of heaven, in the midst of pain and of suffering, amidst war, injustice, we can wait and hope because our king is the king. He's got the power, the dominion, and the wisdom over all of it. Death and Hades does not have the final word. Injustice does not have the final word. Pain and suffering does not have the final word. Jesus, the king, has the final word. He wants us to be aware of that. And then lastly, as we close, the other thing I think he wants us to be aware of is that he, he knows us. Not only is, the king, is he the king, but he gave up all of that to come and experience what we experience. Gave up all of his rights as king and experienced all the pain, all of the suffering, the frustration, even the waiting. Like he, Jesus, wait, he was, Jesus is God. He's outside of time for all of eternity and subjected himself to time and he, and he waited he probably like waited in the grocery store line. I don't know if there was traffic, donkeys and stuff. I don't know. <laughs> waited for his carpenter tool to get repaired. Like he had to, he just, he had to wait. Just like we have to wait. He had to, he had to wait, you know, in the garden of Gethsemane, knowing that death was coming. <laughs> he knows what it's like to wait. Not only that, he knows us. He experienced death and experienced being dead. 
which I think is different. So all of us, I mean, we have, we are alive. We have no idea what it's like to be dead, right? And that not knowing, especially when it's not looking good for your health is terrifying, right? But Jesus descended into hell. He knows exactly what it's like to be dead. He's been there. And oh, by the way, he like rose victorious after descending into the dead. On our deathbed, we can wait and hope because he's gone all the way down and he will deliver us. He went to the very gates of hell and provided victory. So don't ever think that you are too far gone. Jesus has gone farther. Don't ever think that your pain is too great. He suffered more. Don't ever think your mistakes are too big. The cross was enough. So on, on this holy waiting Saturday, while we thought God was doing nothing, <laughs> we're idiots. <laughs> he, was do, I mean, he, was, he was going to the very gates of hell and conquering sin and death. We can wait and hope despite the pain and the death all around us and in our own hearts, we don't have to take control. We don't have to do something. We don't have to fix ourselves. We don't have to worry or fear. We can wait and hope. Our Savior has conquered death for us, for you. And he is inviting us into a resurrected life with him. I want to close with Isaiah chapter 40, verses 30 and 31. It says this. It says, even youths shall faint and be weary, and young men shall fall exhausted. But they who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Please stand as I pray for us. God, thank you for the wait. Thank you that when it seems like you're doing nothing, you're actually doing 10,000 things. God, help for our hearts to learn how to wait and hope how to rely on your promises and your word and your truth. Let us wait and hope as we expect your resurrection and your victory. Pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.